I think we're going to continue now, if you guys are ready. The next topic is tropias versus phorias. One of the difficult things we have in the eye doctor's office is the patient that comes in complaining of double vision. I mean, it's a nightmare for everyone trying to figure this out, and it usually slows our clinic down just because it takes a while to tease out. You know, I actually like neuro-ophthalmology a fair amount because unlike most of what we do, which is image recognition, can you recognize a corneal ulcer? Can you recognize glaucoma just cupping in the back of the eye? This actually takes a fair amount of reasoning to do, and for that reason, it's not a fun topic traditionally, but we're going to see if we can, we can do this. But there's really only one goal with this entire lecture, and that goal is to figure out what's the difference between a tropia and a phoria. Now, this looks like a complicated definition, but this is the best one I can come up with, and this is what is written in your notes. But the idea is that a tropia is a misalignment between the eyes. It's always there. Um, it may be obvious. It may not be obvious. But a phoria is something quite a bit more subtle. So, for example, if you have two patients, one of them comes in and says, you know what, I woke up this morning and I've got double vision. Look at my eye. And you look at their eye and the right eye is turned in towards the nose. This is a large tropia. It's, it's always there. It's very big. Compare this to another patient who comes in and says, you know what, I get tired in the evening for the past few months. I start to see double when I'm looking at the television screen. And their eye looks normal. This could be a tropia, but it could be a phoria. And so let's explain the difference by actually looking at some cases. Now, once again, I could have animated this entire um, lecture like I've done for some of my neurology lectures. However, it's very time consuming, and I wanted to show a whole bunch of examples, and it would take me a month or so. And so what I did was very similar to the last lecture. Um, I basically created a cardboard cutout of a couple of eyes, and using my camera and some basic animation techniques, I've come up with this device. And I call this the eye monster because he's got eyes that are going to move in very funny ways, and we're going to try to figure out what the problem here is, how to name it, how to recognize it, and... That's about it. Our job here is not to find the cause. I'm not looking, is that a third nerve palsy? Is it a fourth nerve palsy? Is it a decompensated exotropia? We don't need to know that stuff. We just need to know how to recognize it and document it. So we're going to begin with some easy stuff, the basic tropias at primary. And when they're very large, they're quite obvious. So in this case, it looks like that left eye is deviated outwards. And when the eyes are deviated outwards, we call that an exo. This is an exotropia. Not too hard. In this case, the right eye seems to be pointing towards the nose. This is an ESO. When the eyes are turned inwards, it's an esotropia. A pretty big one is quite obvious. Now, when one eye is pointed up, in this case, it looks like that left eye might be deviated upwards. We call this a hypertropia. And when one eye is deviated down, we call this a hypotropia. That's the basic naming conventions. Now, it doesn't really matter so much what primary gaze is because we're going to talk about some more interesting stuff. How do the eyes move and how does that change these things? Now this is an exotropia. That left eye is deviated outwards and for the most part is deviated outwards a little bit on all directions of gaze. You know, a lot of people who are, say, born with a ocular motility issue uh, or even develop some type of palsy, like a six nerve palsy, if you give them enough time, they become comitant, which means that the, the problem, the exodeviation is there pretty much in all gaze directions. But we're going to talk about some more interesting things. Let's talk about some tropias, some very obvious misalignments that we only see with different directions of gaze. So, for example, on this eye, straight ahead, great. So that looks fine. But if you had them look off to one direction, you notice that that right eye is not getting out. In fact, you might even say that that right eye becomes esotropic. It's cross-eyed, at least when they try to look to their right. So one way to describe this would be a right esotropia. But... We'll come back to that because what we need to talk about if we're going to talk about eye movement disorders is the cardinal directions. Now, let's do some basic eye anatomy. As we know, the eye sits inside of the eye socket like a scoop of ice cream inside of a waffle cone. And there are rectus muscles, which uh, do up, down, left, and right, which attach to the surface of the eyeball and go all the way back to the back of the eye socket at the annulus of Zen. And these rectus muscles at a very simplistic level uh, affect the eye direction in this way, up, down, left, and right. But the reality is that the eye socket is a little bit more complicated than this. There are some other muscles back there. There's the obliques, the superior and inferior oblique, which do some funny things. Uh, in fact, the superior oblique, the trochlear muscle, uh, fourth nerve palsies hit this, uh, actually has a little pulley up in the bridge of the nose, and that pulley changes the direction and can cause some very complex things. This is not important, but what is important is that the skull of the human is not like this diagram. 
We are not robots up, down, left, right. We are not like that. In fact, if you look at the skull of a horse, their eye sockets are pointing outwards. And the reason why is because they need to see potential predators that might come and try to kill them so they can run away. If you look at a more violent creature, such as this small cat, um, <laughs> their eye sockets have rotated forward and they're facing forward so they can see their potential targets of prey, or milk in this case. So what's better than the cutest kitten in the world? Pretty much any dog. And so this dog also has eyes pointing straight ahead. And of course, the biggest predator of all time is the humans. We're top of the food chain. And if you look at our skull, for the most part, it's pointing straight ahead. But it's not really. In fact, if you look at a CAT scan of a human skull, you'll see that the waffle cone, the eye socket, at least the medial walls near the nose are pretty much straight ahead. But the outer walls of the eye socket actually shoot off at a 45 degree angle. So it's not quite straight. And because of that, when the superior rectus attaches to the eye, it doesn't attach, well, it attaches in its correct location, but its action isn't a pure up and down. There's a little bit of a twist. It's slightly off to the side. And so if you actually look at the, the gauge directions, it looks a little bit more like this. And this is what we call the cardinal directions. It's not up and down. It's slightly to the left, slightly to the right. And so when we check eye muscle movements, we don't usually go up, down. We do, but it's more important to hit the cardinal directions. And this is how we do it. So, Back to our eye monster, we always start with primary. I typically go left and right just because you pick up a lot of issues with left and right because a lot of things are ESO or EXO. And then I make a box, a square. So I start up on top, cross over, ignoring the straight up for the most part, and I complete my box and we're back to primary. And so this is how we do the basic cardinal directions. And how would you chart that? Well, you could have, like we already described, said that was a right esotropia. They go cross-eyed when you try to look to the right gaze. Uh, another way to chart this is actually write out the cardinal directions like a cross with a line through the middle and put a percentage where 100 percent is normal, zero is no movement, and this is one way that I document basic large angle issues like this. Another way you may see, depending on your doctor, is they may write it like the big H because the H's are technically left, right, and then the four corners of that box. And with this scale, zero is normal, Minus four is no movement, and when it's a plus number, it's an overaction. But we'll see some examples of that. But let's look at another eye. Straight ahead, primary, everything looks good. Let's do our cardinal directions, look off to the right. Whoa, that left eye didn't get out there, did it? Okay, everything's okay in this direction, but let's look over here again. Once again, it's not getting out there. We'll do our box, hit all of our cardinal directions, and it looks like that left eye can't quite get towards the nose. The eyes are a little wall-eyed. We'd call it an exotropia, right? that's apparent with right gaze when they try to look to the right. It's really the only time we see it. Or it might be more accurate just to write it out. You know, if you don't want to name these things in your head, you'll get confused. Just write them down. You can think about it later if you want. But this is how I would write out that eye muscle problem. Let's look at another eye. Primary, everything seems okay. All right. Let's do our horizontal gaze. Okay, that looks fine so far. No issues there. And that looks fine. Okay. Let's do our, uh, let's do our box. And we go up there. Look at that left eye. It's not quite getting up as high, is it? So that left eye is not getting up. So that means that left eye must be hypo, it must be too low. It's a hypotropia that's really only apparent with upgaze. And we might write it like this. When might you see something like this? Well, a lot of patients who have thyroid problems in the eye, thyroid affects the inferior rectus muscle, it fibrosis it, and the eye gets tethered and they have a hard time looking upwards. So that's a case where you might see something like that. Here's another eye. At primary, we're good. Let's do our left and right horizontal motion. Everything looks fine. Whoa, what was that? See that left eye? It did something funny there. Watch that left eye carefully when it looks off to this direction. It seems to shoot upwards a bit. Now that's an odd look. So over here, it's maybe up a little bit, but for the most part, we're back to normal, but it shoots up maybe a tiny bit at the end there. So that's interesting. That left eye shoots up. It's a hypertropia because it's going upwards. And you only really see it when they look off to the right. So this would be a left hypertropia with right gaze. We might write it like this, 140%. It seems to shoot upwards. Another way to write this um, would be like a plus two. When would you see this? Well, if you have a fourth nerve palsy, you'll sometimes get this funny upshoot like that. A lot of kids with congenital esotropy or other issues have what we call inferior oblique overaction. It doesn't matter the names of these things because our goal is not to describe what's causing it. We're just documenting it. We can think about it later. We can spend all night thinking about it. As long as you write it out, the percentages, you can figure it out later. So let's talk a little bit about smaller tropias, and this is where most of us, I think, have the harder time figuring it out. So far, everything's been obvious, but what about this case? 